Aren't you glad we got air conditioning? Amen. Glad to have you all here today. Let's see what we have here. We've got Dan singing this morning, so look forward to that. Missions back in the entrance of the church. Remember that if you would. Trustee meeting not till September. Let's take a look at our prayer list here. If you don't know Marie Finley, uh, actually Reverend Finley used to be the pastor at this church back in the 70s. And uh, so it was Reverend Robert Finley, and of course he's passed away. But uh, his son-in-law is Kenny Finley. And uh, he's a police officer. And he passed away, yeah. I, I'm going to say about a month ago. And so, uh, what? Longer. Longer than a month? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll pray for Marie. That's the whole point of it. Uh, <coughs> just getting used to life, you know, um, without Kenny. And I just think we ought to pray for her. Joyce Albert has continued back problems. And so we want to keep praying for Joyce. Carol Washick, one of our friends from Blakely, had a bad fall, and so she's kind of banged up a little bit. We need to pray for her. And Kim Gillardi, correctly spelled. <laughs> and she had a couple of mini strokes. I see she's got a monitor on this week, and so uh, she's trying to get to effects, the bottom. Yeah. She's okay. She's uh, she needs your prayer. They're um, checking her heart. She's yeah. sick. She's very foggy in her head. She can't get her thoughts to come out. Quickly. Really? And she's a little unsteady on her feet yet, so we, we were making her walk with a cane. Oh. Uh -huh. All right, so we need to pray for Kim. And again, we have uh, Houston, Texas, Church of the Week, Abraham Hernandez. And you might have noticed last week there was a Houston, Texas church with Geraldo Hernandez. There's actually three brothers out there, and uh, they're all pastors out down there in Texas, and uh, they also, they have a uh, car repair outfit. And uh, so we met them at conference over the last few years, and just really good guys, love the Lord. So that's that, Church of the Week. Don Gribbles, the Senior of the Week. Uh, Doug Grenewald, Missionary of the Week. And of course, we need to pray for our children, our young people, and the uh, pillars of civilization. Anybody else ought to be added to our prayer list here this morning? Put well, my brother Tim on there. He, he's in uh, almost to his 12 treatment, chemo treatment for uh, cancer. And then he has uh, looked forward to a test to find out uh, when his surgery is going to be. Yeah. What is his name? Tim? Yeah. Jim? Tim. Tim. Tim and me. Right on Mrs. Martin's son. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? The Beth family? Yeah. If you didn't know, Reverend Carolyn Beth, is, or Reverend Charles Beth's wife, Carolyn, passed away this week. Certainly needs our prayers. Joe? Yeah, we have a friend that his name is Dave Pinker. And he's going in tomorrow uh, to see a surgeon about having both of his shoulders removed and put in artificially. So they're going to you know, probably schedule a time for him to go in for that operation. Okay. So we need prayer. Anybody else? 
all that's going on in Florida with that Haven, yeah. Surfside Beach, how many people are probably lost and the families that are waiting and for the workers who are trying to clear everything and do, they're, they're at high risk even trying to do that. Okay. Anybody else? All right, let's set sail. <laughs> Why don't we open our handles to 365? Now let's all stand as we sing.
Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you. you. May be seated. And let's bow our heads. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, what a great day it is to gather together here this morning in this house. Set aside. Nobody lives here. This isn't uh, a gymnasium. This isn't a uh, just any old auditorium. But this house has been set aside that we might gather together and worship you, honor you, seek you, <coughs> work at being genuine disciples. Would you please pour out your Holy Spirit upon us in a special way this morning? That you give us guidance and wisdom and understanding and direction and a deep and powerful sense of your presence in our heart. That we might know that the living God has created the heavens and the earth and who's included us in this magnificent universe loves us, longs to be with us, walks with us, watches over us, will never ever leave, nor forsake us even unto the end of the earth. So our Heavenly Father, we gather together this morning and worship you and thank you, praise you. You have been so good to us. You are so powerful and so just. And our Heavenly Father, we are in desperate need of your power, your courage, your grace, your stamina, your love. Our Heavenly Father, we have friends and family on the prayer list here this morning. You're thinking primarily or particularly this morning, of friends who've lost loved ones in recent months, and even really in the last year. And we have had so many, Lord, that are part of this fellowship, or a part of our greater church family, but also members of the community. And uh, we are grateful that we can commend our loved ones to the hands of a loving and merciful God. But down here, it takes some real adjustment. And so, Father, we ask you to be with our friends and family and stay. Those who miss, those who have gone to be with you the most, fill their hearts with peace and hope and assurance and help them as they adjust to new life, new phase of life. It's, uh, it's so many things that were just so familiar and so routine and so regular have been disrupted in so many ways. So we ask you for our friends and that you would help them. We ask for physical touch upon our friends and family. We have <coughs> folk who have back issues. We have folk who have uh, different issues in their organs and all kind of things that need surgery. And uh, Lord, we ask you to put your healing hand upon each and every one. We're grateful that your arm is never shortened. That you might heal at a touch, heal at a word. And so, Father, we humbly ask that you would bring that to pass. We also know, our Heavenly Father, that <coughs> wisdom you have decided that it's not always the best way. And so, Father, we ask you for grace, for strength, and for faith. That we might trust you for the things that we don't really uh, rightfully understand. Just help us to walk with you and know you always do what's best. You don't always do the good thing. And if we'll walk with you, one day these things will all become clear. And we'll be so grateful that you did everything the way that you did it, and not the way we wanted. So our Heavenly Father, we ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us guidance and wisdom and understanding. Every single day we make choices and decisions. There are many things in our lives that are have hardened into habit. Some are really good and some aren't so good. We ask your spirit to come upon us and continue to purify us and cleanse us and remake us in the image of Christ. We're grateful that you have told us that it is a daily process and a daily project that you take up with us. And so we ask you, Father, to continue this work of sanctification in our hearts and in our lives. <coughs> we pray for our friends down in Houston, Texas. And our buddy Abraham, we ask you to fill him with your spirit and allow him to preach and teach fully and freely. We pray that that house might be one that would be full of your spirit, 
both in and out of worship. These folk might know your presence and your power, and they might be a genuine lighthouse down in that community. We pray for our buddy Don Gribble. We ask you to watch over him again as another one. Getting used to this new facet of his life, this new avenue of his life. And so, Father, we ask you to please comfort and strengthen Don and help him. You know his situation far better than we do. Doug Renewal and his missionary work. We ask you to put your hand upon him and continue to give him guidance and wisdom and direction. We pray for our young people. Toddlers, students, young people going into the workforce. Our Heavenly Father, we ask you to speak to their hearts. But all too often they are so consumed with the things of this world and with making a way in the world and with building a career and with uh, these new challenges and uh, new things that are taking place in their life, changes that are taking place in their very bodies. We pray that you would draw them close to you. Speak to their hearts and call them to the great life of Christ and make them to know and understand that the things they heard and learned at the kitchen table, here in this house, in these Sunday school rooms, back here and downstairs, that those things are life and those things are life. <laughs> they are truly in <clears throat> We pray likewise today for pillars of civilization. We pray for our law enforcement officers, state police, local police. We pray for these uh, Border Patrol, ICE agents. We pray for our health workers who show up in the middle of the night, uh, first responders, those who work at nursing homes and in hospitals and in all these various clinics and uh, satellite outfits. We pray that each and every one might know that your hand is upon them. They do a very special work, and we appreciate them, and we really trust them and need them. For all these things, our Heavenly Father will put in your hands. So many other things we could bring up this morning, but we'll leave our public uh, request to these. We ask you to hear and answer all our prayers. Everything that should come from our heart. As we join our voices together, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And now we have special music from Dan. Today I chose a song that's uh, it's not a traditional or contemporary Christian song, um, but with Independence Day coming up next week. Um, this, this really spoke to my heart. Um, and let me just explain why. My, uh, my grandfather, William Markey, served in World War II where he fought in the Battle of the Bulge and uh, also had the distinct honor of being a personal guard to Charles de Gaulle. And uh, he passed away at the age of 72 in 1996 on my 17th birthday. My brother, Specialist David Moyer, served in the Gulf War where he received a Purple Heart and two Bronze Stars. Unfortunately, he acquired Gulf War Syndrome and was also poisoned with depleted uranium. And he became part of the 22 military suicides per day, taking his life eight years ago last week on Father's Day 2013. I attempted to follow in their footsteps, joining the Army in February of 1999 but only lasted about two years being discharged for medical reasons. So I, I hope you like this song.
But in the midst of it all, there are men and women who have signed on the dotted line to go wherever they're sent, stateside or somewhere over on the other side of the planet Earth, where the uniform of the United States Armed Forces. And our Heavenly Father, we pray for them, that you put your hand upon each and every one. Make them to know what a noble thing it is that they do. I'm sure it becomes routine what they do. If they feel like they're just guarding a fence, or they're just putting in time somewhere. <clears throat> but the day and the hour comes, inevitably, when those people who have shown up really have to show up. We just ask your hand be upon each and every one and that you watch over them. Make them to know in their hearts that you love them and that they have support back here. Our Heavenly Father, as we open your word here this morning, we ask you to speak to our hearts. We want to be the people we need to be down here in this world. We need you. So we ask you to come and make us to know and understand that we have an advocate in heaven, one who speaks on our behalf, and a tabernacle not made with hands, but one that is eternal in the heavens, and that is the real deal. And for these things we'll thank you if you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Once again, we continue through the book of Hebrews, and the underlying theme again and again through the book of Hebrews is that Jesus Christ is the ultimate. Okay? It started out in the very first verses. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He's not speaking to us through prophets, many and various ways, but He speaks to us through a Son whom he appointed heir of all things. Okay? Everything that is the Father's. All of heaven, all of earth, all creation, all it is. Jesus Christ stands as heir to those things. Through whom also he made the universe. Everything we experience, everything that is, everything that you will ever see, Everything that you will ever imagine was spoken into being by one Jesus Christ, the Son, the ultimate revelation of God. He goes on and he says that the Son, speaking of Jesus, he's the radiance of God's glory. The radiance. You go out on the porch today, you can reach out as far as you want. You could be tall as David Warmoth over here. And even get on the tallest ladder we have, or up on the steeple of the church, and reach, and you'll never touch the sun. You just can't get there. But you feel it, don't you? Especially today. Because the sun gives off what they call radiant heat. And that radiant heat radiates off the sun and sends these, I guess, heat waves and they contact physical things, and they heat physical things, okay? So, God is in a faraway place. We've never seen him. We never shook his hand. We never sat across the table from him. We've heard he's our Heavenly Father, but now we see in Jesus Christ, the only one who can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. He is the exact image, the exact representation of God. How about the parables of uh, Jesus when he talks about uh, a landowner going to a faraway place, and from that faraway place he's left people back there to take care of his farm, take care of his, you know, uh, acreage, and from that faraway place we're left here to supervise, to take care of, to work, to build, to make this planet. And he sends representatives. He sent prophets. And they came with messages from God. And we read in the Bible that for their trouble they were slain. Sawn in half, 
thrown in a mud pit, thrown down in a well, sold into slavery, harassed, humiliated, embarrassed, and rushed off because the spirit of this world wishes God would stay far away, wishes God wouldn't involve himself, wishes God wouldn't come here and interrupt all the good that we have. We want everything God's made. We want everything God's given us. We want the life we have, but we don't want him involved because he calls us to do it right, to be right, to walk right, to just to experience and be right and in accord with his creation. And of course, in the parable, finally, he sends his son. And when the son comes, he receives much the same treatment as all the others. Beaten, humiliated. I was saying this last night. Just think about how, if you wonder about the corruption of this world, now look around, it's a magnificent world. I mean the heavens and the earth. Just when you drive home today, look at the lushness of these hills. Just a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, there was a tangle of sticks. It was gray, it was brown, everywhere you looked, nothing really vital. But now look at the lushness of these trees. And the fullness and the foliage is absolutely magnificent. And the healing power of the human body. We have people, I mean, we've had people over the years who've had strokes. And I remember one of our ladies in particular, Lois Kareem, and she had a terrible stroke. I remember seeing her in the hospital. She laid in that hospital bed. It looked like there was a huge vacuum cleaner over here sucking her face in this direction and just pulling her that way. But the day came when that lady sat straight and she could talk and experience her family and walk around. She made a tremendous recovery. And we've seen so many cases just like that. The resilience of the human body that God has put. And with his healing hand, raising up what? Nurses and doctors. This is a magnificent universe. Don't get me wrong but it's fallen and infected by sin. And so that when Jesus Christ walks the earth, Jesus walks through the streets of Bethlehem, or excuse me, through the streets of Jerusalem, and he walks to a man who has been lame, can't get healed, lost all spirit, lost all heart. He says, what would you like? The man says, well, I can't get what I really want. I'd like to get down in the healing waters, but I can't make it, and I'm just stuck here. And Jesus says, you get up and walk. Take that cock that you've laid on for your whole life. Walk home. And the man gets up and walks. And the blind man. How about that? Born blind. His parents certify that he's blind because once Jesus heals him, people say, he couldn't really have been healed. He must not be the guy who was born blind. He must be somebody who looks just like him. That's what this is all about. And the man says, oh, no. And the man ends up saying, you know, this is an amazing thing, you people. That I was blind and now I see. And you wonder whether Jesus is a good man or not. And you would think people would just swarm to him. Just swarm to him and say, Jesus, what can we do to keep you here? What can we do to get you to stay with us? Because... I know that blind guy. We have a friend, Nancy Gustus, down in the church in uh, Mountaintop. And her husband was a lifetime state trooper, Jerry Gustus. And actually her son's a uh, state trooper. He's a career state trooper. And, uh, Jerry is uh, not what he used to be. He's gotten older. In fact, he just did some, put some stints in his heart trying to build back some circulation. Uh, but Jerry was the classic state trooper. I mean, he had the, the white, uh, you know, uh, what do they call it? Temple hair and uh, silver and, I don't know, probably six foot two. Classic state trooper. But he can't go out and do yard work like he used to be able to do. 
his body's failing. When I was talking to him last time, and he says, well, you know, at least I can see. Because I always thought to myself, if you lose your eyesight, boy, you're lost. So I thank God I still am able to see. Jesus walks over to this man who spent his life blind, speaks to him, and the man sees. Why didn't the world swarm around Jesus and say, look, Messiah or no Messiah, if you can bring that kind of relief to anybody here on this planet. I mean, I was watching this week on uh, YouTube, <laughs> farmers, there's a guy over there in Ireland, and he works on the hooves of cows. And I mean, these cows have like an abscess in their hoof, and he comes and he pairs away the hoof, and he grinds it with this thing that looks just like a grinder, like you grind a piece of metal, right? And he works on that hoof, and he opens it up, and he shows you these particular cases where, you know, it's full of infection, and it's full of abscess. And I'm talking about a cow. And I'm looking at it thinking, oh, God, thank you so much for this man who comes and helps these poor animals who limp in the stall in pain, and then he works on them, and he shows them, they walk out, still have a, an artificial half hoof, so they can walk as comfortably as possible, well, that other half of the hoof heals. And they're, you know, cows. I mean, they're walking in manure all day long. They're walking in mud. Uh, they're walking on concrete because it's easier to clean, and so that's not good for them. And I'm looking and thinking, this is, I mean, I'm, this is wonderful what this man's doing for cows. And Jesus comes into the world, and he speaks to the blind, why don't we just swarm around him and say, Lord Jesus, any salary you want, any house you want, anything you want, it's yours. Please, just give sight to the blind if that's all you do. But what did the world do? What did the spirit of this world do? The spirit of this world, the leaders of this world looked at him and said, this man is too popular for us. Everybody's listening to him. They're not listening to us. He's got to go. We've got a system here. We've got something built up. And we don't want him spoiling it. But don't you understand what he's doing? He's at the devil. That's how he's doing it. That's the reception the Son of God got. And they nailed him to the tree. And put him in a hole. And stoned the hole in. And put asphalt around the stone so that it would be sealed. And then put a government official seal on the stone itself. He said, don't touch this. This man is dead. He's politically been exiled. But on the third day, he walked forth from that grave because you couldn't contain him. That's the Son of God that God has sent on your behalf. Lisa and Eddie have a daughter headed for being a lawyer. But I don't have a very good opinion of lawyers. You need them. When you need them, you need them. But I've seen all too often where the lawyer comes in, gives a lot of advice, you settle for half a million dollars or something like that, and they walk away with $25,000 in fees and all the rest of it. And so instead of getting you out of the trouble, they've just basically sealed your fate legally and walked away. That's the way it seems to me. Maybe I'm wrong for thinking that way. But what a lawyer's job really is, is to advocate for you in language you can't speak. They're to go in that courtroom and they know the protocol. They know how to speak to the judge properly. They know the codes, the laws, how things are to be properly interpreted. Not, not our living room interpretation, not our coffee table legalese, but they know how to get in that courtroom and speak on your behalf. They're called advocates. Advocate, ad, it's a Latin thing, advocate, ad, to. They speak to somebody on your behalf. And God sent not just a prophet, not just an apostle, but his own son to be your and my eternal 
advocate speaking the language of heaven. And how can he advocate? That's where this comes, that's where we come to today. Jesus, the great high priest. Because that's what a high priest really is. That's what a priest really is. A priest is an advocate. He speaks on behalf of his congregation. He presents offerings on behalf of his congregation. He's one of them, and he's been appointed, like Aaron, the great priest, appointed by God. The people came and said, well, Aaron, how come you're the priest? Who appointed you? Who died and left you, boss? Why would you have to be the priest? We've got other people in our families that are just as qualified as you. They're Levites. And God spoke to Moses and he said, get them all up. Get a branch. You put all the branches together over here in a pile. Shave them off. Pare them down. And put the sticks down there in the ground. And tomorrow morning we're going to come in and we're going to find out whose stick is whose. And the stick that budded, the stick that's still alive, is the representative stick of who the priest is. So this is something again. God is appointing his priest. It's not something that a man appointed. Uh, Aaron wasn't someone Moses chose. They went in the next day and it was Aaron's rod that had the buds on it. God made Aaron's rod bud and none of the others indicating this is my chosen priest. He didn't choose this for himself. He didn't come with, to me with an application. He didn't come to me and say, hey, I'm looking for a job, got anything in the line of priesthood. Uh, I think I can do it, I think it'd be really good. No, God looked and said, I want this man to be our priest, your priest. And he chose Aaron over all the rest. Jesus Christ is superior to that hand-chosen priest, okay? We're also going to read how Jesus Christ is superior to that hand-chosen priest, because you know what happened to Aaron? Same thing that happens to every priest. He got old and he passed away. And then another priest comes along and he gets old and he passes away. And on down the line, we have a great high priest, one who speaks on our behalf, an advocate, not down here in this world, not in a temple made with human hands, but goes eternal in the heavens, all eternity, right? He goes to the Father in heaven and speaks on our behalf. And as the high priest, he presents a sacrifice. But down here in the earthly temple, right, they've got a special routine. You can't just show up with any animal. You've got to have select animals. And they have to be carefully prepared and presented at an altar made of stones that a human being put together. Jesus Christ, the great high priest, who advocates for us, doesn't go into the copy, the symbol, the example, because you and I know, oh, well, I'm talking about those bulls and, that I saw on TV this week. You shed the blood of a bull, that'll never wash away sin. You shed the blood of a goat, it'll never wash away a single sin. It's all symbolic. It's all ritual. It's all religion. We have an advocate who is hand-selected by God, eternal in the heavens, doesn't live, doesn't die. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, without beginning or end, and a priest who presents at an altar that doesn't have to be purified, that doesn't have to be cleansed, that doesn't have to be sanctified. It's not a symbolic altar made by human hands. It's the altar eternal in the heavens. And what does he present? The blood of bulls and goats? Far better. The blood of the very Son of God. What stands between you and God? What sin in your life? What sins in your life? What habits that you've wrestled with your whole life? And you know they're not good. You know they're not healthy. You know they're not right. You know that there's sin at the root of this. The blood of bulls and goats will do no good. But we have an offering by an advocate in the heavens that does the real work of cleansing the soul. Presented by who? 
the same one who spoke the heavens and the earth into creation, who knows how the human soul works. Again, we talked about Jeremiah. The heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful beyond all things. Who could know it? The heart of man. We like to say, God knows my heart. And all too often, when we say, God knows my heart, that's drawing a curtain down and saying to other people, don't judge me. You don't know what's inside me. And it's an excuse for sloppy Christianity. It becomes an excuse for, don't try and judge me by by me, hate by hate, my by, God, by, um, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> don't judge me by my behavior just because what I do is so offensive and so wrong. My heart's right. Because the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful beyond all things. And the heart will convince you somehow that what you're doing is right when the Ten Commandments carved in stone by God say you're wrong. But my heart says it's okay. The words of God, spoken by prophets, spoken by apostles, spoken by the Christ. But those things are antiquity. They're antiquated. They don't mean anything anymore. I know better. You don't know my heart. The heart is desperately wicked and deceitful beyond all things. God knows the heart. Will you surrender that to that advocate in the heavens who knows us inside and out? We could, I, I could probably fool Sue Henderson. Maybe not. But maybe I could. Deceive her. Put on a ministerial garb, act ministerial. That'd probably be a dead giveaway, wouldn't it? <laughs> but anyways, I can fool some people down here. And you don't fool God. And you don't want to. And be honest with him. Be straight with God. Don't call what is sin one of the modern whitewashed uh, psychobabble sociological uh, mishmash and try and pass that off on God. There are things that are sinful. Why are they sinful? Why has God identified them as sin? Because they will ruin your life. They will hurt the people around you. They will hurt your wife, your husband, your mother, your father, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and you personally. And to try and test what God has said is sin is something that's an alternative. You kill yourself. I don't even know if you kid the world. It's a deceitful, desperate thing that needs a Savior who is eternal in the heavens. And so the Apostle writes, and he says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to the faith we profess. Hold on, this is in religion. This is not temple religion. And that was ordained by God. There's nothing wrong with religion in its place. But religion, it's only as powerful as what it symbolizes. This is the real thing. We have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven. Not into a, a, a tabernacle made out of animal skins. Not into a temple made out of stone. Beautiful as it may be, lined with gold. But he's gone into heaven. And he's Jesus, the Son of God. So let's hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way as we are, just as we are, yet he did not sin. We've got a great high priest who's not like the human, regular, ordinary high priests who have sin on their own account. That they've got to get sanctified. They've got to get cleansed. They have to be ritually purified before they can go and represent anybody 
they got to take care of this one first, and then anybody else. But this one, he's gone into heaven itself, and he's not unable to empathize with our weaknesses. He's been tempted in every way. Think in your life, what are the temptations to sin? <clears throat> now be honest with yourself. Close your eyes. Don't look at your wife. Don't look at your husband. What are the temptations in your life? What were they when you were young? What are they now that you're old? How about in middle years? Jesus Christ knows exactly what it's like to be tempted with all those things. Every single thing human beings are tempted with, Jesus was tempted with. And yet he, without sin. So he doesn't need sacrifice. He doesn't need offering on his behalf. But he knows how easy it is to fall. Because he has experienced the feeling. He has experienced the deception. He's experienced the whole world going that way. But he alone was able to overcome that. Let's look what it says. One who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. So because that's true, let's then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Walk into God's presence in confidence, openness, boldness, it can be translated. Not afraid to let God see what's in your heart. Not afraid to talk to God about what it is that you do in your life that you need help with. Not afraid to talk to God openly and freely about everything. He knows. You're clean. You have a high priest who advocates for you. You're not going to be condemned. You don't have to hide from Jesus. You need to come clean with him. You're his. He's not going to send you away. He's the great high priest, not a human one. Although he was human in every way as we are, yet without sin. He goes on and he says this, approach the throne of grace with confidence. You know, uh, I would want my children or anybody to say, you know what, I think I could go talk to Rev and tell him what's going on and ask him to just listen or maybe give some advice or help in some way. I feel like I could trust him, okay? That's what we want. And so a child can go to his father and sit in their lap and talk to dad. What this says is we have a great high priest eternal in the heavens. And since we do, we should feel free to go talk to God openly, plainly, sincerely. Tell him the truth. Discuss why we feel this way. He knows why you feel this way. He'd like for you to talk to him about it. He knows our feelings. He knows our temptations. Let us approach God's throne of grace. It's a throne of grace. Isn't that good news? It's not a throne of judgment. It's not a throne that is represented by a... We used to have a, a, a stained glass window in our church in... Uh, uh, Newcastle. And there was a lady in the church, her name was Sarah Elizabeth McCullough. And they built the church around 1902. And Mrs. McCullough died, it was right around the time they were building that church. She was 28 years old. She died uh, in childbirth, and they, they didn't buy a gravestone. You can't find a tombstone for her in the cemetery there in Newcastle. What you do find is a big stained glass window with a picture of her. And she's in period clothes. I mean, it's 1900. And she is in the picture. I think her hands are... Like, she's going like this. But in the stained glass window, it looks like she's going like this. Because it's the two-dimensional thing. It's just, you know. And so she's got her finger like this. And she's thinking, I guess. But she's pointing at you. And it's kindly, 
kind of a ghostly scenario. Fascinating stained glass window. The throne of grace isn't a throne that's represented by a finger pointing at you. The throne of grace isn't represented as a place where there's flames boiling about on both sides and the Father sits in the middle just waiting to find out if you need to be thrown into that, those flames. It's a throne of grace. It's a throne of mercy. It's a throne of forgiveness. Because a great high priest, if you want to use the word appeased, satisfied the wrath of God on your behalf. And there is no wrath anymore. Jesus Christ has absorbed it. Jesus Christ has exhausted it. I love it. You get a battery, right? And just when you need the thing to work, the battery is, maybe it's even started to corrode inside the flashlight that you now so desperately need because the battery has exhausted itself. Its energy's gone. And you flick the switch and you get the faintest light and then it's gone. It's exhausted. The power of sin has been exhausted. No more energy. No more power. You're free to stand before God Almighty and talk to Him about your life and have that relationship for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Holy Word. Because again, Lord, these aren't things that we made up. This isn't just some ancient idea that early church people had that thought, hey, this sounds kind of cool. These are things that actually happened. Jesus Christ actually came to this earth. The heir of all things, the creator of all things, took the form of a man and said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He hung from the cross, shed real blood, died a real death, experienced a real burial of his corpse. The corpse, the dead body of Jesus Christ was put in that tomb the corpse and it was sealed and the gospel writer says it was asphalted they asphalted around the stone they sealed it with tar and they put the governor's seal on there don't touch this this is protected by the empire of Rome but the problem wasn't on the outside, the problem came from in. And that stone rolled away. And no asphalt could hold. And that seal just rolled over on its side and out walked the Son of God. And the word from heaven is that He is our brother. He is our advocate. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. His life the Apostle Paul said, it's our life. As alive as Jesus is, it's just as alive as we are. And it's called eternal life. Father, would you speak to us about these things in Jesus' name? Amen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let us open our hymnals and sing 227. 227. <coughs>
There's nothing like it. The Holy Spirit inspired these words a couple thousand years ago. And they speak to us as freshly and cleanly right now as the day they rolled off that pen. Our Father, would you speak to our hearts about this? The message from heaven is, I, the God, the creator of all things, I love you. I sent my son for you. He's your advocate. The love I have for my son is the love I have for you. And you're a part of my family. And the things that you chase in this world that you think will bring happiness, that won't. I'll help you. I'll destroy the power, and I'll help you shed those habits. Father, please speak to us about these things in Jesus' name. Amen.